Losing our beautiful, beloved daughter Lizzie at such a young age and in tragic circumstances has been devastating. Our immense loss impacts us every second of the day and the tragedy has affected our church family, the community and further afield in significant and unimaginable ways. We support the making of this video to raise the profile and importance of inclusivity and it is our hope that others do not and will not have to suffer in silence alone. Nick, you were Lizzie's uh, priest, so what was she like? Well, I first met Lizzie when we moved into the area um, in 2005. And she was a little girl, uh, but we came with an even smaller child, um, our son. And um, first thing she did was she ran over, picked him up, played with him. Um, because Lizzie, all the way through her life as we knew her, she loved kids. Um, and one of the big ambitions of her life was to have a family of her own. Uh, but there were lots of parts of Lizzie that shone out. She was a very gifted musician. She played the flute um, in our worship group uh, here in St. James uh, and Emmanuel. And uh, she sung with a choir. She was a, a gifted scout um, and loved the outdoors life. And by all accounts, her, both her schools, her primary school and her secondary school, um, they would say that she was one of their most gifted. Um, so she was a gifted, talented, attractive and loving uh, young person. So do you remember how and when you heard that she had died? Yeah, and I'll never forget it. Yeah. Um, she died on Wednesday the 10th of September 2014. But I didn't hear um, what had happened until the next morning. You know how when you come downstairs, if you're like me anyway, you, you pick up your mobile phone and you see if there's any text messages that have been left um, overnight. And it's a bit of a bad habit, but I look at my phone and there was a text message on there and it was from my colleague, um, who's another clergy person in the team was at the time. And on the phone, it said, um, whatever time of day or night you receive this message, call me. So I phoned him and he said, you're going to need to sit down, which I did. And he said, um, Lizzie Lowe uh, took her own life last night. And he told me the story. And the reason he knew was because his house was on the way home from where the incident took place. And... Lizzie's dad and brother had stopped in on the way back. And um, that's where all of our lives turned upside down, was that moment. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you and how did the congregation respond uh, in the aftermath of Lizzie's death? Well, the first thing uh, that I did was I went straight round to Hillary and Kevin's house um, into a scene of complete devastation, as you can imagine. But in the immediate aftermath, there were a lot of people to talk to. We drew up names. I went and visited. I shared the news. I watched dozens of people just crumple as they heard what had happened, because Lizzie and her family were key members of our church, still are. And we opened the church two days later, this place, mm. to anybody in the community who wanted to come. And we had hundreds of members of the school, her old school, her new school, church members, community members. They came in, they cried, they went out. They came back in, hugged the whole evening. But there was a feeling of stillness here and at that point, the church seemed to be part of the answer mm -hmm. 
because we were offering comfort and pastoral care. We were doing what churches do when tragedy strikes a community. It was only later at the coroner's uh, hearing that we discovered that actually it had been our conspiracy of silence, as it were, around the issue of sexuality that had been the crucible in which Lizzie had existed in those months up until her death. I think those early days, they will live with me for the rest of my life. And they need to live with me for the rest of my life. Because this must never happen to another teenager ever again, to anybody ever again. That the issue of sexuality leads a child, or an adult for that matter, to that point of desperation. And that the church, in its own way, whether through ignorance, through silence, or through deliberate application of theology and creates an environment in which a tragedy like that can take place. After the coroner had given his verdict, what were the steps you took to allow the congregation to become inclusive? Well, we did things in a slightly back-to-front way. I wouldn't recommend this particular course of action to a church that wasn't in crisis. Mm -hmm. But we were a church in crisis and essentially we had a child protection issue to deal with as much as anything else. And so in the January after the coroner's hearing, this is January 2015, the PCC passed the inclusive church statement. and. Uh, normally, of course, you would engage with your congregation and begin a process of listening that may ultimately lead to a statement like that being approved by your church council or your PCC. But in our situation, many newspapers, Twitter and social media, they were, they were looking at our church, how would we respond? And I, we needed to make a very definite response and a quick response, and so we passed the inclusive church statement. Well, that was painful for our church because what transpired was, is, it all, is exactly what we thought would be the situation. Some people in our church community were naturally very inclusive, had um, reconciled that with their theology, while others were more naturally conservative and were very wary about um, the issue of inclusion. And by passing the inclusive church statement, we actually found those two groups settling out. And that was a very difficult situation pastorally to deal with. Uh, a number of people felt that they couldn't carry on with us any longer and left at that point. Um, but in order to almost give space for people to air their views and to talk, we held three listening evenings. One was on sexuality and scripture, one was on sexuality and reason, and uh, one was on sexuality and Christian tradition. And we had a, a range of speakers come from outside, and we also had testimony from gay Christians uh, so that we could see and experience the lived reality for uh, that group within the church. And those were very moving stories. And then we had small group work afterwards. And actually the process of listening in that way enabled the church community at large to see that there was a range of opinions and that it wasn't just a kind of a church PCC or council or ministers versus the church or anything like that. It was actually a community owned issue and that we needed to work this through together. And I wouldn't say even now that everybody in our church is signed up to full inclusion. Some people, most people are, but some people aren't. I would call what we have in our church a yielded consensus that people may not all agree in full inclusion, mm -hmm. but they've decided to accept that as the community decision and live by it. Um, and so actually that's shown a huge graciousness on all sides, actually, that we can come to that position of yielded consensus. But now the policy of the church is one of inclusion. Even if 
some individuals within the community are not there personally, theologically. Uh, they accept the decision of, of our church. Good. And after her death, there was an, an inquest. Mm. And did anything transpire there that had not been known before? Yeah, well, when, when Lizzie died, um, the church community went into um, a state of terrible shock. Um, but nobody knew why she'd taken her life. Um, we opened the church up to all of her school community, to all the wider community. We uh, rallied around the family, uh, Lizzie's parents. We um, tried to help the community make sense of what was going on, but we were really working in the dark because we didn't know what had happened to Lizzie, why she'd felt so desperate. Three months later, on the 19th of December 2014, uh, Lizzie's parents invited me to go to the inquest. Um, and what transpired was that Lizzie had this huge gap in her life between her faith that meant so much to her. She was a really committed Christian young person. But she was also... Um, wrestling with and coming to terms with the fact that she was also a gay young person. And somehow in her mind, in her spirituality, in her psychology, she just couldn't bring her Christianity and her sexuality into a conversation. There was a gap there. Mm -hmm. And it was clear from the coroner's hearing that this was a really big part of her decision to take her own life. She just didn't believe that God could love her the way she was. And this was obviously a huge shock to all of us, but it was also the start of a, a journey of deep reflection for the church. How could we allow the silence around sexuality to create a context in which Lizzie couldn't discuss what she was going through? Mm -hmm. And so there was an enormous process of self-reflection, communal repentance, um, and trying to plot a way forward so that something like this would never happen again to another family or to another church community. And can you uh, give an example of, of how exactly the church reacted in a way which perhaps would have been different from before her death? Um, we, uh, together as a church, made a statement of inclusion um, after the inquest um, from the Inclusive Church Organisation. And it explicitly welcomes all sorts of minority groups um, into the church at every level, including the LGBT community. Now, some people... Um, couldn't stay with us on that journey. Some members of our church left, which is very painful as a church leader. Um, but as a consequence of this statement, we also found that many others joined us. Mm -hmm. So we have um, LGBT Christians, uh, but we've also found that we've drawn um, adults with learning difficulties and uh, we have people from a whole range of racial backgrounds who've joined the church. Um, and so what we found is, is that by making the church safe for one group, we've actually made it safe for a whole range of groups um, who uh, now find a welcome in our church community. Right. And has that, do, you, do you feel that that has enabled your congregation to have a more profound theology, a bigger understanding of God? or? change their outlook? I think one of the things that, um, I mean, we were a fairly typical open evangelical community where sexuality was just something we didn't touch or talk about because we knew that it was a divisive issue. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you don't talk about an area like and as profound as important as sexuality, actually it begins to close off conversations in all sorts of areas and you don't realise that's happened until you 
open the windows, as it were, onto, onto that subject. And once you've done that, once it becomes safe to be gay and a Christian and in church and as involved as you want, actually it's almost like it's given permission to everybody in the community to talk, to ask questions, to think about new ways of understanding our relationship with God. Well, if we're going to understand the Bible in this way, how does that impact on all these other things? What does faithful, committed relationship look like? How do we define and understand what a healthy relationship is? It sort of begins to open one box after another, which I guess could seem threatening to some people, but it's actually been very liberating. And it's also meant that people can ask questions and be honest about things in their lives that perhaps they were hiding away before. So there's, I think there's been a greater honesty in worship since we became an inclusive church. And I've certainly noticed that in our worship, which seems fuller and richer uh, than when we kind of had to put the awkward parts of ourselves to one side as we came in through the door. Now we can just bring all of ourselves in and it's okay. And that's a much healthier place to be. And would you, would you in any way see this as, to some extent, the fruit of the seed which had died? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, what we went through as a, as a church was the most unimaginably painful experience. And um, there were days, weeks, when I didn't know how our church was going to survive what we were going through, particularly when the wider church and the media got to know about Lizzie's story. We had a lot of external um, people were looking at us to see how we would respond. And there was a pressure about that and a scrutiny almost. And I wondered how we would get through it. But actually, as we began to just slowly begin the process of working on inclusion, working on the theology that underpinned that, and then suddenly finding that far from the church being damaged by that process, was actually coming to life through that process. Well then, people from all over the country, and in fact even from other parts of Europe, have been coming to us and saying, you've had this conversation, your church is doing okay, it's, it's not collapsed in on itself. It, you've, you've got people coming from all over, you've got a Farsi community, adults with learning difficulty, you've got gay members of your church. Tell us about this. And actually, it's almost like from the tragedy that was Lizzie's death, kind of life is not only growing in our church community, but it's popping up wherever anybody's asking that question. And people are coming and saying, help us to start this conversation. How do we, how do we begin? Is it safe? Is it going to be okay? And so actually, in one sense, the seed that died I wish we could reverse time. I wish so much we could take, take back that time and, and speak to Lizzie before it was too late. But also I have to say that what, what Lizzie's done is she's given a gift that has been growing and we're passing it forward and then other churches are passing it forward and it's making a huge difference. So yeah, there's been resurrection out of the tragedy.